Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching. This video begins a note-by-note -note dissection of Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen in what I hope will be its entirety. Built on nearly two centuries of Wagner criticism, it's a massive journey I hope you'll take. Never mind one I hope I'll be able to complete. For an explanation of who I am and more on the reasons for this series, please check the preface video. First in a group of six, building a foundation to this in-depth analysis. It isn't required, of course, nor is the historical and musical overview in the five following it. Though, before diving into this video, you'll probably want to at least watch the three immediately prior to this one. The case for Erda, the case against Wotan, and the case for Loge. These contain details of how and why Wagner manipulates his musical syntax as he does, while identifying key morphemes which define the entire work. Lastly, these videos provide the overall syntactic narrative rationale for the Green Ring's approach. Links are naturally provided below. My aim is to mount subsequent videos every week until the entire ring is analyzed. Shaw's Fabian Allegory, Donnegan's Archetypes, Natier's Metaphor of Music History, Sikora's Theory of Deconstruction, Abate's Narrative Contra Music, these and other symbolic constructs for Wagner's ring will now be set aside. What follows treats its dramatic plot as a forthright narrative without any need for symbolic explanations to clarify. If we are to accept the hypothesis that Wotan's ur crime motivates Erda to revenge herself, setting Loge to spring the Rheingold trap, this should be unmistakably reflected in the musical syntax of Rheingold Scene 1. In short, Erda's most basic modules, along with the various world ash intervals, and at least some Loge morphemes ought to play crucial interconnected roles in the orchestral prelude. The passage begins as a textbook illustration of the Natural Overtone series, an acoustic law which forms the core of tonal music. The absolute first note of the ring is a low E-flat on contrabasses, doubled at the octave, meaning by its first overtone. The second overtone of this initial E-flat, which is the fifth above, or B-flat, follows after another four measures, sounding atop the contrabass pedal on bassoons, doubled by its own first overtone, meaning at the octave. These octaves throb up and down between each other, effectively a sine wave, one of the ring's DNA building blocks. This lasts another 12 measures until the Erda melody's embryonic form, what Cook dubs the original nature motif, twice rises uninterrupted on 8th, then 7th French horn, contrabass bassoon, throb continuing unbroken. The eighth horn's second iteration is overlapped on its final two measures by the seventh's next strophe, itself similarly overlapped by the eighth's following iteration, the sixth horn beginning its pulse of the morpheme atop the eighth's second measure, and the seventh's final one, a procedure followed by fifth horn. Fourth horn alters this by initiating its pulses in the middle of the eighth horn's first measure, and horns three through one follow this parallax, beginning each of their strophes a measure after the horn before them. This pulsing overlap of the same morpheme across eight voices at a parallax creates a continuous stream of rising waveforms, whose perpetual crisscrossing is itself wave-like. At measure 40, horn 8 lingers on a dotted minimum tied to a dotted crotchet, then reverses its direction to sync on tied dotted crotchets, sketching a tonic arpeggio on thirds, ended with a fourth and fifth, after which it lifts a twelfth to repeat the process on tied dotted crotchets. Meanwhile, beginning at measure 41, sixth horn follows suit at the same time horn 4, after its first dotted minimum tied to its previous dotted crotchet, sinks in dotted minims on the same tonic arpeggio. With each successive measure, each subsequent horn follows suit. Horns 8 through 5 on dotted crotchets, 4 through 1 on dotted minims. 
while at measure 41, contrabass, tuba, bass clarinet, joined E-flat pedal, maintained throughout by contrabasses. On measure 43, Wagner tubas assumed the bassoon's B-flat. These crossing downward patterns of interwoven horn lines make the entire passage a sort of huge, rising-falling wave into which the embryonic nature morphine dissolves. Aptly enough, the epoch's first embryonic rustling of Erda Twilight. The horn choir, maintaining its non-stop falling arpeggios at a parallax to introduce the prelude's next important sonic milestone. As a brief aside, some will find this point-by-point -point examination needlessly exhaustive, in which case they should be reminded this will be a note-by-note -note analysis throughout. Wagner's technique is indeed this minutely detailed, and it's emergent for those studying the ring to grasp his every move. In my opinion, the prime failing of stage productions is their visual deaf ear to these sonic landmarks. Stage pictures almost never respond to the many sonic evolutions as if they weren't important enough to be staged. The result is an overall visual tapestry reduced to a kind of formless wallpaper, which muffles rather than intensifies the music. It isn't merely tedious to look at, but shatters the work's vital associative process by ignoring the details of its syntax. Audiences have no way of relating what they hear to what they see. No wonder the Meister's web of meaning has remained obscure for almost two centuries. With measure 45, the first ever strophe of the Erda melody rises on bassoons. Against them, cellos initiate the morphine bundle's wave-like quaver signs, the first acceleration of that ever-increasing sense of watery motion which drives the entire prelude. It should be noted only two bassoons take the Erda melody, while the third maintains the E-flat pedal on a breve minimum dotted crotchet the first note in each of a long chain of signs leaping up an octave, the work's first ascent on that fateful interval, to fall a fourth, then a fifth back into the tonic, only to repeat. The Erda melody sounds six times, flutes joining in one by one, third flute on the second pulse's last notes alone, second and third on the third pulse's final two cells, first flute joining the other two in sounding the fourth iteration in its entirety, a process which allows first and second bassoons to gradually abandon the melody's line for tangential rising-falling waves in the same long, short, long rhythm as in the melody itself. With the third Erda melody iteration, violas join the cello's sinuous yet defining meander. On its fourth strophe, cellos pass it to violas second violins, while on the fifth, violas abandon it to the full violin choir, thus gradually brightening the overall texture. By this, the melody's fifth pulse, flutes have completely taken it over only to abandon it themselves midway through its sixth iteration, truncating it just prior to its heroic notes, with the development of that initial hint of the world ash octave from the contrabass bassoon pedal of the prelude's first bar. It's been implied by the third bassoon line, here continuing in exactly the same way, while at measure 62, flutes and first bassoons expand it into a more conclusive embodiment of its subtle octave movement. A unique ostinato figure whose variants repeat with slight alterations throughout the next 44 measures. In performance, these interlocking triadic harmonies obscure what only a well-trained ear might pick out. First bassoon repeatedly intones a falling octave, while first and third flutes repeat upward octaves at a parallax. The cumulative effect is unmistakable to any listener, one of those Wagnerian acoustic innovations which look ahead to late 20th century electronics, just as the prelude as a whole anticipates that era's minimalist school. In effect, these octave doublings reinforce harmonic overtones set up by the horn's continuously repeated overlapping tonic arcs, along with the ever-present fundament overtone thrum in contrabasses, bass clarinet, and low brass.
The eerie, glistening whistle created is so insidious it easily penetrates even the densely complex orchestral textures surrounding it. A sonic lean of natural energy cresting the orchestral waves complete with its darker aspect in bassoons. This moment highlights the prelude's lift from initial darkness into a generalized glitter of natural power before it continues on to become more specific. In ensemble, these pitches outline a 6-4 version of the Erda Melody's last heroic module, underpinned by second bassoon. As such, they dissolve the melody for the next ten measures into only this module, as the violin choir winds slowly downwards on the wave pattern, until first violins are replaced by violas. During the last two measures of this descent, meaning at the bottom of the viola's sine waves, the flute module adds the slight wrinkle, making its descent a retrograde version of the heroic notes, harmonized in second flute opposed by its original in first bassoon. This retrograde seems a chance detail, merely a way to reassign the woodwind gleam, as discussed in a moment. Yet it's one of many slight variants in the prelude destined to spread its influence far across the epic. It also launches the prelude's next phase, as contrabass trombone creeps into the contrabass's overtone fundament. The Erida melody resumed in a new orchestral guise to make it still more recognizable to the ear. This isolates the clarinet choir alone, which speeds up the Erida melody's rising notes to move at twice their original rate, as cellos take the sine waves at double speed in semiquavers, the horn's stately tonic waves continuing unaltered atop the unbroken low woodwind brass contrabass pedal. The slight alteration allows the upper woodwind bundle to complete the morphine by adding a ghostly strophe of its final heroic notes. After it sounds twice, the air to melody notes twice repeat, the sign module arranged so that its quavers sound only during the clarinet's held notes to create a sort of perpetual motion. This introduces a noticeable change in the air to melody hence its next major variant. The clarinet choir's deceptively simple rising-falling-rising sine wave can be parsed into six different and distinct ways, whose mutations shape much of the work's coming syntax. A great deal of their influence reaches as far ahead as Goethe Dameron, often welded together throughout the work with other modules into composites, having many different levels of meaning thanks to their malleable simplicity. This begins with another swift but partial strophe of the Erda melody, meaning without its final heroic notes, those being supplied by their high woodwind echo. This highlights the original morphemes launch on a pair of three consecutive rising pitches, also explaining why this variant initiates on its truncated form to continue its first deceptively simple module with a chain of three rising notes opposed by the direct inversions. Henceforth, this analysis refers to the rising form as melody notes, its falling echo reverse melody notes. The clarinets trace what seems a chance variant, mere pleasing filler to vary and extend the prelude's texture. Nevertheless, this segment forms the basis for one of the epic's best-kept syntactic mysteries. Its elements oppose rising, falling, scalar signs with their opposites, falling, rising ones, both of which become their own individual morphemes as the work develops, each with its unique syntactic meaning. As interestingly, the held notes beginning each sign don't merely parse them to the ear as individual elements, they also isolate the movement into chains of reverse erdachords, which are then mirrored by the erdachords themselves. Finally, these repetitive erdachords will become the heart of Loge's most distinctive morpheme. Here in the prelude, this seems a reflection of pulsating life, burgeoning under Erda's unseen influence, and it's in that sense their later morphemic evolutions inform the tetralogy.
As a final indication of the rich evolutionary potential of this Erda variant, the flute bassoon scintillation above it varies to twice alternate between its original heroic melody notes and their inversions. Another three strophes of the speeded-up melody pulse follow. Oboe's English horn augment its last two iterations as viola's second violins overlay the cello's sinuous sine waves at a parallax, their tips also implying the final three melody notes, echoed at a crotchet delay in the flute bassoon module. The newly strengthened woodwind choir again intones two partial strophes, followed as before by their wave-like extension in a single pulse, woodwind choir again trading heroic melody notes with their inversions. The original swift Erda variant then returns again in its entirety. The second pulse is filigreed by first violins doubling at the octave second violins wave. It's at this point trumpets initiate a falling rising tonic sign, synchronized with third bassoon's continuing rising falling arpeggio, horn sine waves unchanged. First and second bassoons, however, take up a mirror opposite of the new varied erda module, as the flute cell increases to the speed of its whistling throb during its last two iterations, only to resume their slower module, voice leading now standardized, thus without octave leaps, atop a last recap of the wave-like erda variant. The overall effect is one of heightened energy, a sort of yin-yang suggestive of life burgeoning in the waters, a dance of fertility, struggle, and triumph. During the last measures of this development, the stage directions call for the curtain to open, heralding the prelude's gleaming climax. Woodwinds both low and high race severally up a chain of tonic scales, while the string's wave patterns cross back and forth in hectic stasis. Amid this impassioned confusion, flutes, clarinets, bassoons cry nine iterations of the Erda Melody's final heroic notes, trumpets reinforcing them at half speed. Through it all, the bass pedal never wavers, nor do the horns leisurely reverse variants on the elemental nature motif, but low brass intone progressively stronger breve minim chords which overlap into a strophe with every measure. The rising woodwind scales are particularly indicative, opposing as they do the spear's downward thrust, a brilliant manifestation launching the entire tetralogy, nature at her most vitally fecund and fluid, a powerful bed of creation mirroring the world ash its spring of all wisdom, and its sacred grove. At the peak of this glorious riot, a wrenching shift from tonic to subdominant cuts off the bewildering wall of orchestration, almost like a gunshot, leaving only a soft horn pedal and wave modules traded between first and second violins. Atop this, Volglinde begins the Rhinemaiden's playful games with her syntactically fertile lullaby, its words an eerie hint of Erda ended by two strophes of an exuberant figure which plays a distinctive syntactic role suggesting variants of delight, vitality, even determination throughout their subsequent frolics and far beyond. Velgunde responds with the lullaby module. It's echoed varied in Voglinda's reply, as she invites her sister to play, which Velgunde meets on leaping air to fourths, followed by Voglinda in another lullaby pulse. Their text, it should be noted, establishes from the beginning. They're meant to be guarding something as yet unnamed. This inspires two measures of vocal silence, as, amid opposing violin signs, woodwinds led by clarinet take a single Erda melody iteration in its swift prelude form that tails into four progressively softer echoes of the melody's final heroic notes. With these, Flosshilda joins the trio, scolding her sister's recklessness on a pair of bouncing lullaby strophes. The first ended on a plunging Erda form, the second aired chord notes. This syntactic evidence, together with her lower vocal timber, establishes Flosshilda as the nymph's leader, their voice of reason. Felgunda, Voglinda's glib enabler, tosses back a flippant reply on a series of four lullaby cells. 
the last two separated by an octave lift capped with a plunging octave unfangen, catcher mark of the nymph's ambivalent guardianship of these vital natural powers. Another woodwind pulse of the Erda Melody's final three notes crowns the whole, goading Flosshilda to a second, more critical scold for her sister's careless exuberance. Unquestionably the trio's sensible elder, her pointed words introduce an unexpectedly influential new morphine. The repercussions of this seemingly inconsequential flourish echo across the entire tale, but for now what an audience most easily grasps is that after the first 167 bars of Rheingold sounding entirely in major mode, here at bar 168, Flosshilda's rebuke drops briefly into minor, throwing Erda's shadow across the texture. Her vocal is simple enough, two closely echoing natural signs, built from the last heroic Erda melody notes to be capped by chord notes. Verbally, Flosshilda is first to directly identify the Rheingold as their charge, while her syntactic modules are entirely of the Earth Mother. Holman is the lone commentator of those cited in this analysis who notes this morpheme, giving an example, but his warning moniker doesn't tell the whole story. Flosshilda reproves her sisters for poor stewardship, and when the module returns in Siegfried Act Two, this informs its meaning. The elder nymph extends her chiding with a more sinuous line, the first which deviates from the lullaby syntax in any appreciable way. This seemingly inconsequential line is actually a watershed moment, one generating a host of syntax. Flosshilda drops a third into reverse melody notes, scolding Besser bewacht, as she creates a module destined to have long legs in the cycle, specifically related to the Rhinebaden's ownership of the gold. The turn it launches is first to make good on the prelude's life-generating Erda sign variant, specifically its falling rising module built from a melody note reversal and their originals. She continues with a flippant downward turn on a minor second ended with a third lift. She then bounces on thirds, followed by another lullaby variant, to finish as the mode climbs back towards a jolly B-flat major, E-flat's dominant, with a descending minor seventh arpeggio, eerily like the ring's first half. Syntax cautioning her sister's fecklessness may result in some unspecified but world-spanning disaster. Each one of her modules are destined to play sweeping, yet individually different roles in the epic, all related to those separate mechanisms which bring about the final catastrophe. With delicious irony during a brief wordless interlude, she promptly joins the nymphs in their frolic, ostensibly to corral them, an attempt they turn back on her, swaddled throughout by first violins, violas scampering across opposing wave pulses, woodwinds and two horns merrily toss up two strophes of the swift Erda melody, which becomes two pulses of its variant, followed by two extensions comprised of melody notes and their reversals. At a parallax, clarinet's flutes intertwine these two iterations with heroic note strophes, echoed by their retrogrades to produce opposing signs, reminiscent of the prelude, while also developing the module's ambivalent potential as characterized physically in the nymph's thoughtless play. Throughout, second violins race up six-note scales taught by trills that end on appoggiaturas, a touch suggestive of water frothing around their play, which in time ripens to important syntax indicative of the often deceptively bright joys of passion. As interestingly, octavo bassoons regularly thump upward graced pedal notes, their frequency doubling as the passage continues. At first, cello pizzicati reinforce them, joined by bass clarinet staggered at a dotted crotchets, its rising grace note reversing as bassoons progressively shorten their pedal notes. The melody note oppositions quiet, as do perpetual string waveforms, 
but with bassoons, bass clarinet, contrabasses crescendo on a regular descending octave thump, following each woodwind pedal note. To the casual ear, this seems mere padding, and stage directors traditionally pay it no mind. But it's a cinematic image of Alberich, unnoticed by the Rhine maidens, creeping out of Nibelheim to observe and lust after their frolics. In time, its trill appoggiaturas acquire potent sexual connotations, just as the regular swift graces attach to Alberich and through him Mima to suggest their dwarfish movements. Meanwhile, the falling octave solidifies its role as a sign of natural energy turned against itself. Throughout the ring, it exerts a primordial negative pull against the positive natural energy of upward octaves. Strings pass their wave modules to low woodwinds, which toss them haltingly back and forth over three additional wordless measures as violas exchange nervous twitches, each separated by dotted quaver rests. These pass through a rising second, then its echoing air to chord notes, a plunging air to fourth, a downward sixth, and another descending fourth, all atop pizzicato contrabasses in a series of falling octaves. It's here the plucky dwarf utters his first words. Albrecht's vocal first bounces over violas, repeating their succession of twitches on interval leaps, sometimes echoing, sometimes preceding, and or following him, a rough grace note effect which becomes a nibelung trait throughout the epic. Here counterpointed by constant falling octaves on contrabasses, a special note is his first utterance, the air de chord notes in retrograde, which from this point are called reverse air de chord notes or more simply reverse chord notes, suggesting a resolve or emotion counter to nature or, at least, bravely free of its cares. It should be noted these not surprisingly outnumber all other syntax in the figure. His phrase continues by descending a four-note scale, destined for its own important associative meanings, which, like all the modules, spring from this first evidence of sexual desire. Tangentially, this cell also includes reverse melody notes, themselves destined for an important sexual racial role. His line triggers bass clarinet in a pair of wave pulses, as the dwarf continues his appreciation with a falling rising turn, like that in Flosshilda's earlier cry to protect the gold, now made distinctively his own, given his lust is the treasure's imminent threat. He continues with another downward scale, capped by a clarinet in a single wave strophe, then finishes with a turn. Weirdly, this echoes a distorted version of giant syntax, specifically its own distinctive turn, another detail to acquire meaning of sexuality fertility. Adding to the mystery, it's comprised of reverse melody notes, followed by their rising originals, a juxtaposition with major syntactic impact across the epic. It's already just sounded in Flosshilda's warning vocal, and previously first made itself known in the prelude's clarinet ostinato, with its sense of burgeoning life, and while Alberich's version distorts it, he still confirms the sexual urge it implies. As would be expected, given the Meister's intricate syntactic technique and the importance of Alberich's first appearance, several other key modules lurk in this passage, if subtly. For one, the dwarf's twitching vocal juxtaposes reverse chord notes with their wanted version. In any other musical work, this would be of little note, and some may claim it to be so in this one. Yet the Meister continues to employ this device as a mark of ambivalent energy, befitting the contradiction implied by its two opposing modules. Not unexpectedly, after only a few more words, Alberich also employs its mirror opposite. What's more, not surprisingly, its source is Erda, specifically drawn from her chords. Dissected into individual notes, the chord's voicing suggests a kind of Mobius strip, a potentially continuous succession of overlapping chord note oppositions, both rising and falling. 
In Siegfried Act One, Mimo hears from the Valsung's own lips how the young hero glimpses his own reflection in a stream, an epiphany which teaches Siegfried his identity with nature. The procession of orchestral air accords which accompany his revelation generate the longest chain of overlapping chord note oppositions in the epic. This is no chance detail of which Wagner was unaware. His syntactic method exploits it throughout the epic. It dominates Loge's primary morpheme, the Tarnhelm, Magic Sleep, the Wanderer syntax. When in Siegfried Act Three, the Earth Mother reveals to the god the full extent of her dreaming might, it dominates her chords. In this light, my analysis dubs its falling rising sine wave modules chord note oppositions. The rising falling versions reverse chord note oppositions. Another opposition, though of a different kind, sounds in the viola line, a rising triad, followed by a descending one. Lest this also be dismissed as mere happenstance, too deeply buried in the texture to be consciously grasped, much less of any importance even if it work, the third clarinet's line falls with the viola's triad by tracing reverse melody notes, echoed at a parallax in the dwarf's voice. As Wagner matures his syntax, these three elements, so closely allied here, spread across its texture to reinforce and evolve the nascent charge of sexuality first encountered as the dwarf appears, never mind its potent repercussions. Additionally, the viola line's rising triad, echoed in Albrecht's vocal, eventually becomes its own syntactic module, as is true of its falling mirror, a cell only just voiced by the dwarf, itself to be replete with sexual racial connotations. Nor is it accidental these three cells roughly align between violas, clarinet, and lustful vocal, while the viola line itself is another embryonic hint of Erda Twilight. Finally, Albrecht's last sinking scale hints at Wotan's spear. The nymphs severally wonder who or what this intruder may be in overlapping vocals. Vogland is bobbing down a third and up a fifth. Flosselda's static notes, including a static world dash interval, then rising a fifth. Velgunda falls a fourth, then follows it with reverse melody notes, capped by a rising tritone, a cell about to declare itself as one of the epic's central morphemes. As they sing, graced violin quavers mimic the viola twitches. Quaver rests between each to describe a comically nervous rising falling sine wave interspersed with three staggered clarinet waves. At the viola sign's bottom, strings race down semiquavers through wave distortions. Violins into violas, then cellos. A sequence to mirror the nymphs swimming closer. At its lowest point, they pull up short in a flurry of winding chromatics. Vogelinde and Velgunde cry out in horror, Vogelinde falling third to leap up after a quaver rest, isolating the rising octave of their pure natural state. Both voices end with the direst possible inverted ash interval on a sixth and third respectively, a shock that moves Flosshilde to cry the alarm. This passage includes the first relatively direct iterations of what are among the best-kept secrets of the ring. Until twisting viola's cellos in the measure just preceding, the scene's harmonic basis is squarely tonic. Albrecht's entrance shifts appreciably away from E-flat major towards the scene's other keys, but after Vogelind and Veldgunde shriek their horror at his appearance, cellos, violas rise from their chromatic welter in an explosive scalar uprush, taken over by the violin choir. The first solid dose of chromatics in a heretofore subtly tonic landscape. This looks forward to scene two, where steady upward chromatic scales mark Loge's entrance to become a key part of his oral signature throughout the drama. Here in scene one, Flosshilde's warning traces a shape whose precursor has only just sounded during Velgunda's vocal in the form of three falling scalar notes, themselves a syntactic germ first hinted at during the prelude, meaning reverse melody notes.
Gods, one destined to throw its influence across the entire tetralogy. It's followed by an upward-leaping interval. This module sounds throughout Rheingold with varied rising intervals, a sign of courage in the face of a threat or obstacle, an idea which goes on to acquire profound heroic significance for the work as a whole. Flosshelder pinpoints what's at stake with the words Das Gold on a rising octave. Her wording, Hüte das Gold, is also a direct reminder of those words in her previous skull, with its own stealthy embryonic module. She finishes her syntax-rich vocal with a procession of cells yet to acquire definitive meaning, yet whose presence here throws light on their later crystallizations. The phrase begins with an inversion of the heroic melody notes, heretofore known only from the prelude, a module destined to suggest nature's powers set against heroism, which here covertly emphasizes that Loge is as much Wotan's foe as his friend. Flosshilda continues with more reverse melody notes to bounce on thirds into a cell she's already sung during her earlier scold. Where previously she left the gold's threat vague, here she more clearly pinpoints what it is, an idea to inform the module as its implications solidify. To isolate that special quality of this gold their father has warned them to protect, without giving them the means to do so, strings weave a cresting minor mode tapestry of waves, until, nearing its peak, Flutes, doubled by oboes with bassoons, two octaves below, ring out the first relatively unobstructed occurrence of the pure world ash interval, complete with long, short, long syncopation. Closely woven into the string waveforms as it is, this module echoes those rising octaves whose gleam for so long surmounts the prelude. It's that very glittering natural purity, as locked in the Rheingold, which is under threat. As an ironic side note, the morpheme also sounds in C major, a key associated with Wotan and his plans. Plunging from this subtly powerful morpheme, the first violin wave turns C major into a falling arpeggio in its own minor seventh harmony, an eerily elongated foreshadowing of the ring morpheme's initial half. It's opposed by seconds on a rising falling sign, Erda's unseen shadow passing across Flosshilda's courage combined with another hint of Erda twilight. Buoyed with the falling octave thump in contrabasses, a twisting cello line supports the dwarf, who calls to the nymphs on a descending third to rise a hopeful sixth, then plunge a fourth, a disjointed phrase very like his initial hopping vocal, which here, though distorted, identifies him on the spot as the very threat of whom Flosshilda warns. The nymphs respond ensemble, atop a measure of clarinet waves, their descending line soon to be an important feature of their taunting capers. Its salient feature, that three-note reversal of the melody notes, here capped by a falling third. To finish the phrase as reverse heroic melody notes. Albrecht's flattering response brushes aside the clarinet waves to bring back the contrabass cello twist as it buoys his admiring entreaty, a parody distortion of the Rhinebeden's lullaby with an eerie similarity to the ring. It's built from a spear-like scale, essentially two reverse melody note strophes, ended by a chord note opposition, and finished by the melody notes proper after the rise of a third. As a last interesting note, the turn at its bottom is a truncated version of the giant turn. After another measure's clarinet wave pulse, he rides a ghostly air chord echo in bassoons with another reverse melody note scale that ends in a chord note opposition, falling triad, and reverse air chord notes, itself a distortion of another nymph cell. Violas take the wave, tentatively at first, as he pursues his almost charming appeal. In two consecutive reverse melody note pulses, Erder chord notes, and another falling triad, begging to tolt unnecht, a potent hint at what that descending three-note scale will come to embody, 
when he concludes on yet another falling triad, itself to acquire potent sexual racial associations. As violas pass the wave to violins in a continuous rising line, Voglinde asks if the dwarf is serious to an embryonic morphine whose rising scale ends on a plunging interval, one soon to be discussed when it ratifies its nation's sense here of chagrin. Velgunde inverts this figure as she wonders if he's joking to make it a crib on the emergent fragment of Flosshilda's warning. The first violin wave crests on her final note to fall in its wanted tarnic arpeggio. As a side observation, these continual prelude wave echoes adroitly sketch with lapidary precision the on-stage action, as Wagner must have seen it in his mind, though directors never follow his lead. Whether on the Rhine backdrop, or with lighting, or in whatever mobility a production allots its set elements, or the performer's physical movements together with those other visual components, the Meister seems to have thought cinematically, crafting his music as if everything on stage would follow its smallest twist. Meanwhile, Alberich expands on his lust for the nymphs in a brief but syntactically rich passage. This figure omits its initial wave plunge on first violins and the following intermittent clarinet wave cells to highlight the passage's deep syntax. The ominous falling octave contrabass's thump continues, emphasized by cellos with that distinctive nibelung grace. Of particular interest is its thrice-repeated air chords on clarinets, their plaintive chord notes emphasized by English horns. Cook opines this melodic idea develops embryonically only with Albrecht's later cry of Veha after the Rhine maidens reject him. While this is true of the court notes themselves, this early passage leaves no doubt they ultimately arise from the chords, given its Albrecht's romantic hopes expressed here whose defeat he later bewails. His vocal is rich, a wealth of modules key to the dwarf's ultimate embitterment. Begun on a pair of rising thirds, which amount to a single diminished minor seventh arpeggio, it proceeds through reverse melody notes into a repeat of that third descent and fifth lift first heard when Flosshilde warns her sisters of Solchum Find. His next phrase rises on melody notes into the maiden's frisking shape with its falling triad, which he concludes with the emerging heroic morpheme also coined in Flosshilda's warning. Notable in these phrases are both extended reverse melody notes and their original three-note forms, both of which cells gradually acquire meaning associated with the kind of urge towards racial fertility the dwarf extols. All these modules come to represent the nucleus of Alberich's sexuality once he's stolen the goal, which only grows stronger and more complex following his loss of the ring. Violas hand their wave pulses to violins, as his vocal continues in a last extended reverse melody note strophe, capped with a plunging third to finish on a wildly hopeful rising octave making it yet another, if distorted, pulse of Flosshilda's warning. The entire sequence paradoxically identifying Albrecht as precisely the threat against which Flosshilda has just warned her sisters. This analysis maintains Loge is the Rhine Maiden's father, who, as part of Erda's plan for trapping Wotan, deliberately arranges this encounter so it should trigger the Rheingold's theft. With its dark Erda chords, syntax implies the dwarf's passion arises directly from the Vala's dreaming power in its sinister minor mode. The nymph's father may leave them naive, but they seem connected, if only innately, to their mother's creative energy through its major mode, while avoiding it in Alberich's sinister minor. Audiences can't possibly hope to make this connection, not so early in the drama, but the epic mulls the central parallax at sufficient length to clarify it for any attentive listener, a distinction native to Loge's very being as underlined by the Erd Accords, both major and minor, at the heart of his syntax. It's the essence of Loki's being as an elemental force of nature that he should grasp this basic light-dark dichotomy, in this case meaning the contrast between love and lust, thus love and lovelessness. 
True, he keeps this knowledge not only from the Rhine Maidens, but the gods as well, but he has his reasons. Various foreshadowing traces of the fire god's influence, such as those already discussed, appear in both music and poem throughout scene one. The subtlest concern themselves with the underlying alliance between Loge and Erida as reflected in the Erida chords. The Vala is the birth of thought, while Loge is the fire of that thought made brilliant flesh. Erda's design turned into action. Donington suggests part of the fire god's power rests in his connection to libido, the hot flame of sexuality. The Alberich Rheinmaiden interactions in scene one, being purely sensual, Loge's covert hand in its events is especially relevant as it continues its work on the dwarf. Right on Erda's schedule, the dwarf's lustful plea tricks the Rhine Maidens into thinking he poses no threat. Rising wave figures, now steadily traded between first and second violins, join delicate woodwind cording to lift the mode out of Alberich's minor back into major, which telegraphs their renewed confidence. Flosshilde, their de facto leader, cites why they needn't fear this lovesick dwarf, her vocal, a retrograde inversion of his distortion of her own warning, continued after a dotted minim rest with the reverse opposition of the Erda chord notes, capped by a low ash interval on a puckish rising Erda fourth. Velgunda answers after descending a third with another reverse melody note strophe. While we don't yet know its full rationale, their thought sparks a decisive reaction as Voglinda tells her sister, Lass den uns kennen, translated by Spencer Millington and Porter as Let's Teach Him a Lesson, a euphemism for meeting out punishment. A more literal translation is let him know us, in the sense of revealing to Alberich their true nature. If so, it's a startlingly cruel spirit in all three, as one by one they proceed to systematically torment a creature who's offered them nothing but admiring compliments, while asking only for their affection. There could hardly be a more dramatic reversal of expectations, an apt metaphor of empathy's treatment throughout Rheingold. Their taunting begins on three echoing vocal phrases, a module Voglinda distorts slightly with an upward third, but which is initiated in its precise shape by Velgunda only moments before, one that often repeats during the epic, here immediately echoed in its more precise outline by Alberich. Worth noting is that Voglinda's first pulse echoes its slight distortion in the dwarf's previous inversion while her second mimics his rendition of its pure form, suggesting this module isn't some coincidence, but the Meister deliberately manipulating his syntax. It's also of note all three versions end on falling sevenths, an interval Cook feels is always suggestive of woman's inspiration, reinforcing the sense this initial version of the module implies expectations turned on their heads confirming that it isn't mere padding but contiguous substance. The orchestra deepens its impact with syncopated chord pulses sinking gently through woodwinds atop first violin wave strophes, which pass through violas then cellos. The slightly indeterminate seventh harmony adds a whiff of seduction as the stage instructions request Voglinda to approach Albany, beckoning him with her last strophe of the nascent morphine, which for simplicity's sake, I'll dub chagrin. Finally, this chordal descent on woodwind sketches an extended arpeggio in minor seventh harmony, an eerie presentiment of the ring's initial falling half, complete with a quartet of falling triads. Given this moment suggests the dwarf anticipates his sexual reproductive needs are about to be satisfied, it's only logical to conclude this arpeggio with its constituent triads must represent sexual racial ideas even as the chagrin modules interweaving them imply something quite different will result from what's here expected, and all thanks to nature's, thus Erda's, imperative. The low woodwind descent ends in static chord pulses, which continue as cellos tail out their waves in shivering finger viola tremolos.
these two anticipatory measures, Albrecht's thrill at Voglinda's proximity, is another subtle hint of Loge, whose sensually charged intimations flicker throughout the Rhine Maiden's mockery, here emboldening the dwarf's vigorous response. I think you'll agree this is enough for a first plunge into Das Reinkohl, and hope it whets your appetite for more. The next video picks up where this one leaves off, at the top of page 24 of Dover's full score. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments below. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.